Good afternoon, everyone. I just uh, thank you for the opportunity to come online today and to share with you something that I find is very exciting. Something that we've done for a number of years here at the River Institute is recognize somebody who's gone above and beyond in their efforts to help the local environment. And this year, through a series of nominations, we have someone who has won the award. He is with us and he'll have an opportunity to speak in a few minutes. When I mention his name, many of you will know who it is, but I'll hold on to that for a moment longer. I just want to run over something. The, the uh, River Award is something that we've done for a few years, and the purpose of the River Award is to recognize and encourage, uh, and encourage environmental stewardship and responsibility in the community. Nominations are submitted by people who are asked if they know someone who would fit this nomination, and this year, uh, our winner or our recipient of the award is Chris Krytoff. So a name many of you are familiar with, Chris has spent the better part of 20 years working at the RRCA. There he has worked tirelessly to bring together the local community with the goal of improving the health of the St. Lawrence River. And obviously a large part of Chris's work was his tributaries for those who are familiar with Chris and his work at the RRCA. His passion for the area led to an impressive list of projects that he, and programs that he has been involved with over his career at the RRCA, including habitat enhancements along the Lake St. Francis shoreline and the Cornwall waterfront, the development and expansion of the tributary restoration program, shoreline restoration program, as well as sitting on any number of local committees where he was always a driving force and in the development of local restoration and management plans. Chris brought obviously 20 years of experience by the end with, of the accomplished work and effort into uh, knowledge, into tributary restoration and into the St. Lawrence area. Of, so certainly Chris's work with the community groups, students and landowners has built a legacy of watershed stewardship. And many uh, people are keen to do their part in improving the health of our local shared resources because of the efforts of Chris. He would spend hours on end speaking with landowners and community members, listening to their stories, understanding their issues and concerns, and in the end up and coming up with concrete solutions that benefited all and certainly at the most to the tributaries and the river itself. Chris also helped to bring the water management and wetland restoration course to Eastern Ontario and helped found the Cooper Marsh Wildflower Nursery, which he is still involved with today. Through the Cooper Marsh Wildflower Nursery, Chris continues his work in the area through education, through community, through plantings, through restoration projects on both public and private lands. And I would be remiss if I did not mention the nominator for Chris so that he has an idea. One of the gentlemen that he mentored over his time at the RCA, Brendan Jacobs. So Brendan has nominated you for this award, Chris. The River Institute Board of Directors has felt you're a worthwhile candidate. We are very glad to put your name on the award and to present it to you, alas, virtually this year. So thanks very much, Chris, and congratulations. Well, thank you very much. I'm, uh, I feel very honored, particularly since it comes from a, a group of people that I greatly admire. So um, I, feel, I feel really good and uh, I feel very proud uh, to, uh, to, uh, to have my work valued and uh, I thank you very much. So Chris, I, as I'm sure you are aware and you've, you've said already, you know, the the efforts that you've spent in this area and in this watershed will uh, continue for years and we benefit from it. You, however, don't live along the water, so you have to drive down and visit as you come to Cooper Marsh and work there and the area areas around here. But your efforts will go on for a long time towards the people and the animals who live on and off of the St. Lawrence. And you're really a great candidate and a great choice for this year's award and it's just been a real pleasure seeing your name come up, remembering all the efforts and work that you've done and uh, living along the river, having the benefit of seeing that for many years to come. So thank you again, Chris. Um, Thanks. If there's, if there's any other last words, I'm just going to pass the floor over to Lee 
Thank you for this opportunity, Lee. I just appreciate being part of this. On behalf of the board, it's been a pleasure and continued success with the symposium. Thanks so much, Walter. And yes, it's great to have you, Chris, and fantastic that you're the recipient of the award. We're all cheering on for that. So thanks for showing up for the for the virtual presentation. Um, next up, we have a very special presentation. So we have Jerome Marty and Patrick Nadeau. Um, I was lucky enough a year ago to be in Ottawa and to see these two perform uh, um, at a Creative Mornings event. Um, they bring facts about the river and they add music and we felt that it'd be a really nice way for us to all connect over the lunch hour on community day. Um, so before I let them take over, I'm going to just let the audience know that if you want to interact, if you want to say you're there, if you want to leave a note of who you are or if you want to ask any questions, I know Jerome um, and Patrick are going to be asking you questions and hoping you'll respond. So um, test that out by just declaring yourself present and um, with that I'm going to hand over to Jerome and Patrick. All right, can you hear us very well? Yes. Thank you Lee. Uh, thank you Patrick. Hi Jerome. Hello. <laughs> um, so um, as, a, as an introduction, yeah, it's really a great pleasure to to connect with uh, river people, uh, river people from the St. Lawrence River, river people from the Ottawa River. I think I'm allowed to remove my mask when yes, I speak, yes, but I'll put it back on. We are at two meters away distances, you can see this. Um, and um, we, we thought we, we would uh, talk about what's, uh, what are some of the key concerns for people who work in the field of, uh, of water uh, in general, and we'll add a bit of fun to the discussion as well. Um, next slide. So uh, one back, please. Uh, we will start with uh, acknowledging where we are. That's right. So um, Jerome and I are in the Riverkeeper offices right now in Ottawa, coming to you live uh, on a virtual platform. And while we do meet today on this virtual platform, we would like to begin by acknowledging and thank the Algonquin people on whose unceded lands we both live and work. I would add that uh, we would like to take a moment of reflections to acknowledge the arms and the mistakes perpetrated on the indigenous people in this country, a country that we call Canada. Um, and we should, we invite people to consider that we can in each, in our, our own way, uh, try to move forward in a spirit of reconciliations and collaborations. And with these uh, acknowledgements, we are ready for the next slide. All right, here we go. So as Lee was saying, this is a, a version of a presentation that Jerome and I uh, gave over a year ago. And what we want to do with you today is take you through a bit of a journey um, and maybe perhaps thinking about water in ways that you've never thought of water before. So rest assured there will be plenty of science nerdiness to be had, but we're also going to think about water from different perspectives, like cultural perspectives, uh, spiritual even perspectives. So. The, the image that you see on the background right now um, is actually a, a, an artistic image of the Ottawa River watershed where uh, we live. Um, and all those different colors are some of the uh, creeks and rivers that all flow into the Ottawa River. Um, so we, we like to have people thinking about, about watersheds and, and what those mean. And you know, watersheds are nature's boundaries. So sometimes we look at you know, administrative boundaries, but really this is the way that nature uh, set things up for us. So interesting to think about that perspective and to always know uh, in which watershed we are at any given time. When we think about the science and water, we often think about maybe the last couple of decades, um, but there is so much that uh, we can learn from the peoples that have been living on that land for millennium. And, uh, the presentations from Lee this morning, the water, the, the, the reports on the St. Lawrence River is that unique opportunity to bridge different types of knowledge. Um, if we think back, back in, in, the, in time, uh, there's been a recognition that water is really uh, has a profound uh, impact on, on the life of people. Water is life. Um, it, there is that connections with the motherhood and the water. And uh, more recently, if we think about the history when the Europeans came uh, on, on this land, 
they started a relationship on the water using the water as a way of transportation. And um, I have always, um, I always want to show the, the wampum belt here that is um, a, a symbol of peace uh, between two uh, nations. Uh, the two rows that you see here in purple represents two canoes that travel in parallel, one in their own directions, which gives the signal that it is possible for different nations to go along in their own way and peacefully. If we look at uh, the history uh, of, of, of this country, you can see that the, the water is everywhere. Uh, we have here a very old map uh, when Jacques Cartier arrived on the east coast of Canada, you can see the St. Lawrence River, old names, La Mer, uh, La Mer Bleue, uh, who was uh, at the time uh, upstream uh, of the, um, in the Great Lakes Basin. Um, and you can, you can really see that, yes, yeah, the, the St. Lawrence River and other rivers were really ways of transportation, highways maybe in some ways, and that really allowed for the development of that region. Um, among these uh, developments, uh, we, we see the rivers as a way of transportation for wood. The lumberjacks uh, is one of the, 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 the key uh, activity that has been observed in the watershed. On the St. Lawrence River, I found this very interesting postcard, not very, very old, uh, showing uh, the, the use of the water to cut ice. So the ice cutting that was used for refrigerations. And just to say that, with these activities came a lot of culture as well, uh, a mix of culture from Europe uh, with local culture, including music and folklore. And um, if I may, I'm just going to provide a sample of what it, it, it looks like. And Lee, I hope it's going to work because I've never done this live like this. <laughs> so bear with me one second. I will take my uh, alternative typewriter. Free performance for you folks. This is unbelievable. World premiere right here. And so the, the, the picture you have here on the left is from my friend Jean-Louis Courteau, who is a, a painter in the Laurentian. And um, so with, if we think about Quebec, Les Coureurs des Bois and the folklore, uh, we usually think about music that goes pretty fast, something maybe like that. <laughs> Amazing. Lee was totally dancing. I could see Lee on her screen. You had her going there. <laughs> amazing, amazing. Thanks so much for that, Jerome. Awesome to follow up an amazing piece like that. Um, so we want to talk about water as a sense of place. And, and to do that, um, what is it? What exactly does that mean? What does water as a sense of place mean? Well, if you start to think about your own kind of personal experiences that you might have with water bodies, um, most people, I would think all people, will come to realize that actually we have these really deep emotional connections with some water bodies. And at Riverkeeper and with other groups uh, like Swim, Drink, Fish, we like to think of those water bodies as, as our watermarks. So they're that, those special water bodies that we hold near and dear. Uh, we all have one and that, you know, come, come with memories or fond memories or experiences that we've lived on our water bodies. So for example, my watermark is the Baker Brook River in New Brunswick, which is this tiny little river that runs behind uh, my paternal grandparents' house. I remember as a kid going to that river, uh, swimming, it was super cold. I remember that's where the, I saw my first turtle in real life and realized that you know there were actually turtles out there in the wild. Um, and I've been going back to my grandparents' house uh, many, many times and over the course of those decades, even seeing how that river has been evolving over the years and even how the riverbed itself has moved many, many meters over time. So that's my watermark. And what we would like you all to do uh, is to think about your watermarks. And in fact, type them up in the chat box. What is your special water body that you, that, that you hold near and dear to your heart? It can be 
in your backyard or it can be halfway across the world. But we want to hear from you. Type those in. We're going to have a look at a couple. What's yours, Jerome, while we're waiting? So I have many, uh, <laughs> but I would say that one that really stays with me is uh, a lake that I very much uh, enjoy spending time. That is the Lac des 31 Mille, 31 My Lakes. That is a, a very long, narrow lakes. Um, about an hour and a half north of, of Gatineau, and that's a place where it, uh, I have lots of memories with my family, my growing family, my new family in Canada as well. And um, it's an amazing lake because it's a clear water lake in a place where most of the lakes are are brown. They have a lot of uh, a lot of organic carbon, but this lake is really crystal clear. So that amazing. is amazing. Amazing. What are people saying? Are we seeing some watermarks from people on the chat box? So we're getting a couple. Lee put in hers, uh, her booms river in South Africa. South Africa. South Africa. Uh, nice, Lee. Cool. Thank you for sharing. Very cool. Still waiting to see if more trickle in as we uh, Excellent. get going. Well, the thing with the thing with these watermarks is that you know these places are so sort of spiritually and emotionally important to us. Imagine for one second a water spill, an oil spill at that exact spot that you were just thinking about, and how unthinkable that would be. Um, that's the importance of water. That is why water connects us so closely with place. And so, slide. yeah, we've got a couple more coming in. Elwha River, Washington State. Washington State. Uh, Belmont Lake, Peterborough Camp County. Um, Peterborough. Lake Nosbuzzing. Sorry if I messed that pronunciation. <laughs> from Mary. Yeah. Awesome. Coming in the awesome. Camp. So lakes, rivers, all sorts of different water bodies that people feel really attached to. Um, and just, you know, when we first gave this presentation as part of Creative Mornings, uh, we realized that this sense of place has also inspired so many creative minds and artists. Um, and if, you, if you're familiar with Ottawa, where we live, um, this, this is a very familiar scene. So there's an artist named John Soprano, who every summer, and he's been doing this for decades, uh, does these like rock sculptures. And they're actually just balanced. There's no glue or anything. It's a very... You have to be very patient. Trust me, I've tried with like two rocks. <laughs> it's, it's way harder than it looks. Uh, but this has become uh, sort of a, an ephemeral landmark in Ottawa and everyone kind of knows this place on the Ottawa River. And so it's a really strong and powerful connection that John is helping us to build there. Uh, these are actually further downstream on the St. Lawrence and St. Flavie, same kind of thing. There's a Marcel Gagnon, who's an artist who's been inspired to uh, put some statues out directly on the St. Lawrence riverbed. And while we're on the St. Lawrence in that neck of the woods, I, I've never done this, this is the first, but I want to give a shout out to my mom and dad who are watching the presentation right now, uh, because with these virtual platforms, you can be watching from anywhere. And my mom and dad also live on the St. Lawrence in Gadzuru, so super big watershed. The St. Lawrence that goes through Cornwall, my parents will be seeing that same water, who knows in how long, <laughs> but we're all connected through water. Some people feel so strongly about it. This is a friend of ours at Riverkeeper, an artist named Emily Rose Michaud. She actually tattooed the Gatineau River onto her arm. That's how strong water connections can be. Please. And then just one final sort of artistic inspiration. So this is a friend of ours at Riverkeeper as well, Gwen Frankton. Uh, when you look at this painting, it's like you've been here before. If you live on the St. Lawrence, if you live on the Ottawa River, you've seen a scene like this before. This is uh, the Ottawa River where it meets Pinecrest Creek, and it's somewhere that's very special for, for our friend Gwen. Uh, but we all have places like this, and so they're near and dear to our hearts, and they inspire all sorts of creativity uh, in our watersheds. All right, so now I'm going to put my scientist hat and, uh, and go through um, a couple of slides about the changes, um, what's the state of water uh, in Canada globally in Canada and also locally. Um, you, you shared with, uh, with us some of your watermarks and um, when you think about those, you, you could also think of the changes that occurred within them. And uh, you may think about uh, changes in water quality, water quantity, maybe there are new species that have arrived over time. This is actually something that has happened quite a lot in the Great Lakes Basin, including the St. Lawrence River. Um, so lots of things are, are changing. If I, if I think about my watermark, uh, the lake that is so clear, I will, if I think about a change, I will probably think about a lake that is becoming greener over time. It was not like that. Um, 
even in the last 20 years, because I've seen that lake in 20 years. So it really speaks to the fact that the changes that we're seeing today, we see them during our lifetimes. And that's a, a big change for some of these water bodies that are so big, like the St. Lawrence River, the Great Lakes, even who are among the largest lakes on the planet. So uh, when you are a scientist, um, you usually say you're a water ecologist, maybe a freshwater ecologist, but the real term is uh, you're a limnologist. And um, uh, this is part of many of the classes that I, I've been teaching. We need to define this because nobody knows what a limnologist is. We even had to create a bumper sticker uh, to, to help people <laughs> um, raising, raising the bar for limnology. So a limnologist is someone, is a scientist, that study uh, lakes, rivers, and groundwaters, which is often uh, forgotten when we think about that. There is even a society of limnologists in Canada that I'm uh, proudly part of, and I invite you to, to become a member, uh, especially if you're a student. Um, the, if we think about freshwater, we really have to think about it as a very precious uh, and limited resource. We don't have a lot of fresh water on the planet. We actually have far enough for the needs that we have in terms of humankind. Um, if we think about the percentage of fresh water, it's only 2.5% of all the water on the planet. And if we look within that 2.5%, there is very little that we can actually use. 0.3% of that water is in lakes and river. And we use a lot of that water in lakes and rivers for all of the human activities, drinking water, industries, agriculture, and so on. So it really speaks about the rarity of, of, of that resource. If we um, go, uh, if we look at Canada, we are known as a country that has the luxury of having a lot of water. We have about 9% of all Canada covered with fresh water. If we add the wetlands, and we heard earlier how important are the wetlands, they, we actually add up to about 12 to 15% of the land cover. Um, this being said, the distribution of the water in Canada is very unequal. We have a lot of water on the border of shields, uh, but we also have a lot of people concentrated in the south of Canada. So there is that discrepancy between uh, the water that is maybe no more in the north and the use of that water that is more in the south. And if we go more west, we have uh, Alberta, Saskatchewan, the prairies, where there are not too many lakes, and they are actually seeing now um, some changes in terms of water quantities and some issues about that. This is a map uh, that uh, that has been developed by um, NRK, Natural Resource Canada, that really shows the direction in which we are going in terms of amount of fresh water available in this country. Um, you have um, in the, the center panel, uh, the reference period where we are in today, and you can see in red that we already have, and this is Canada, we already have areas that are in very dry or extremely dry conditions. And um, if we look at um, um, projections for the future uh, under continued emissions or under rapid reduction of emissions, you can see that that red surface is increasing. So on the right side, on the top, you have a, a good scenario if we are able to limit our emissions, which we are hoping to do um, in the coming decades. But if we continue the way we are today, it's going to get clearly a lot more red than it is today. And we will have areas that are going to be very dry with significant droughts in the future. Um, tomorrow, I think as part of the Science Day, you're going to hear about uh, the WWF report. And some of these maps are really helpful to understand the health of ecosystems and the health of watersheds uh, across Canada. And you can see here that although things are pretty good, we don't have a lot of humans in Canada, uh, we do have Im some significant impact uh, on some of the watersheds. And all of these watersheds, or most of them, are in southern Canada. You can see we have that belt of red at the south, uh, at the border with the United States. You can also see that even the, the uh, Ottawa Riverkeeper is not in green in that, in that map. <laughs> we have um, a, a level that is not super red, but it's still a uh, colored, quite colored. What are the issues? What, what do we see in terms of changes? They are linked to several themes, pollutions, habitat loss, habitat fragmentations. We use too much water. We have invasive species that are disrupting the food webs. We see the global impacts of climate change, 
and we also change the flow um, of many rivers in our uh, watersheds. Um, I will just give a, a, one more uh, piece of information, scientific information linked to biodiversity. We, we did talk about biodiversity in wetlands earlier today. Um, this graph is a fairly recent study from um, our colleagues at Carleton University, Steve Cook, who will be a speaker tomorrow as well, that really shows that fresh water needs more attention. Over the last 12 years, we've seen a significant reduction in the number of freshwater species. A loss of about 84% globally between 1970 and 2016. And you can really see that, uh, that uh, graph here on your screen that speaks to the urgency to look at freshwater biodiversity. Studies have looked at the threats uh, that have become more and more acute over the last decades or so, and I, we have a long list here. And thinking about looking at that list, you can think about where you are today. And the St. Lawrence River has seen many changes, and I think almost all of these apply to the rivers we have nearby us. Impact of climate change um, is seen everywhere. Um, we've seen more and more uh, toxic algal blooms through cyanobacteria. The rivers that we have around us all have dams, and Patrick is going to mention that uh, in, in, in a little bit. We have emerging contaminants, um, but we also have a legacy of contaminants from the past that, are, that we still need to deal with. Uh, we've heard about microplastic that is becoming an increasing threat uh, globally. We have noise and lights, some of the new, very new recent threats, lights in particular, very interesting work and research being done on the impacts of lights on aquatic um, organisms. More and more salt, which is uh, typical of Canada as we, um, we have a, a harsh winter. So to go back to a more local picture, this is um, a map that I made um, a couple of years ago when I was a scientist at the River Institute and we looked at the land use of the watershed. Um, and you have in that these bright colors the bathymetry of the St. Lawrence River. And um, for that area, we've seen changes in land use. Uh, we have a lot of agriculture. Uh, we used to have legacy industries that have contributed contaminants in the water. And what, what makes the area special in some ways is the shape of the river and the lake. We have here in blue a seaway that is fairly deep, uh, where most of the water from the Great Lakes flows towards Montreal. But on the sides, what we see is a very shallow environment. And in cases like that, it really allows for a, a bigger impact of what is happening in, in the land use. So the, in these shallow areas that are separated from the middle, we're going to see uh, increased nutrient levels, some issues with algae, and sometimes as uh, I remember about 10 years ago, we were reporting the first um, cyanobacteria species in the water. So land use has an impact, uh, but it's particularly important to think about that in the case of Lake St. Francis because of the shape of the system. Uh, these are a couple of pictures from the past. Uh, things are improving. Uh, we see that the water quality uh, in, in, the, um, in the St. Lawrence is improving because less and less nutrients is being, are being discharged. That these are great news. But these are some of the pictures from the past with the green soup um, and uh, cases where we had to close um, beach areas, recreational areas in the area. Algaes are not always bad. I just wanted to share, going back to our creative morning talk a couple of months ago, um, algaes are also extremely beautiful. They are also a, an indicator of good health. They could be both. And uh, these are pictures of diatoms, a group of algae that, are, that have a, a skeleton that is really spectacular. The geometry uh, is, is fantastic. Uh, panels and centrals here. Um, some uh, people have used uh, fluorescence techniques to get really good pictures of um, algaes with their pigments. Um, so it has also inspired artists, not just scientists in some ways. And actually, it, some people have used algae to make uh, drawings and art pieces that, as you can see here, uh, made with marine diatoms. And those are real, those are microscopic images, right? They're they real. Are. That's so cool. So cool. Jerome has officially made me an algae fan, not yeah. going to lie. <laughs> um, so we have, we, we, we talked about watershed, being watershed aware. We talked about this a bit earlier in terms of how water connects you to place. 
Uh, personally, what I like to do when I'm traveling is to uh, figure out what watershed I'm in, you know, and to always know you see a river perhaps in a, in a new town that you're visiting. Where is this river going? Where does the water come from? Um, and so it's really important to be watershed aware and it's also important to understand the, the issues, the specific local issues that might impact the water where you live. Um, and uh, whether that's the St. Lawrence or the Ottawa River here, and that's actually how we work here at Riverkeeper. So Jerome was talking about some of the threats uh, that impact, that can impact our waterways. So I, I, we wanted to share a few of those with you in a bit more detail to show you some examples. Um, endangered species are certainly one of those threats. Um, and before we show you, I don't want to show you the next slide because I can't remember if it's if I'm going to ruin my punch. So I'm not going to show it to you right now. But endangered species are certainly uh, an issue. And as Jerome saw you, showed you those really dramatic plunges in freshwater species numbers. So we're going to quiz you for, for a second and see, can you think of a freshwater species that might uh, be in a precarious condition right now? So that might be threatened or endangered, uh, potentially even in the St. Lawrence. So throw out some ideas in the chat box of, of freshwater species that you think might be in bad shape right now. And our, our trusty sidekick Matthew is gonna let us know when they're <laughs> coming the in. Is. Bit of a delay. Bit of a delay, they're coming in, they're coming in. So think about, it doesn't only have to be fish, remember, just any freshwater species uh, that might be on the decline uh, in the St. Lawrence. And it's a big system, right? So might be in the Great Lakes, might be in the fluvial portion, might be more in the estuary. Still coming, still coming. So <laughs> here they come. People are madly typing away. All right, there's a guest of a cutlet minnow. Cutlet minnow. Oh, yes. Cutlet minnow. Uh, anonymous puts in American eel. American eel. Anonymous coming right back at you with some more information. Plans. A couple more guesses of American eel. Okay. Northern pike mm -hmm. is a guess. Uh, Blanding's turtle. Uh huh. Lots of guesses and lots of good good ones coming in. What tends to happen is that a lot of these species are, you know, undergoing declines, whether or not they've been officially recognized uh, by the different government agencies. Sometimes there's a lag there, right? So we know that some species aren't doing so hot, even though they might not be officially listed yet. There's uh, that's a reality as well. But we had a few people naming American eel, and we do want to narrow in on that one. Uh, it's a common concern that we have between uh, the the St. Lawrence and the Ottawa. They're so cute this is literally a river keeper we're on like a total marketing mission here to get people to think that eels are cute and they're fascinating species truly their life history is amazing uh, but they're also in trouble and so just to illustrate how much in trouble they are we're gonna get you to do one more uh, little game here which is you are going to pick a number between one and a hundred and type it into the chat box right now numbers but one number between one and a hundred and type it into the chat box. The oh. reason, oh, go ahead. Don't all pick the same number. Yeah, don't all pick the same number. We just want to keep you honest. That's why you have to type it in the chat box. So we know we know it's legit. The reason we're asking you to do that, and we are going to all pretend that we collectively, everyone that's part of this conversation right now, we are eels. Uh, let's say 1978 or so. We are the St. Lawrence population of American eels. All of us together. Now you've picked your number. I'm going to tell you the one number that I had in mind. Are you seeing them coming in, Matthew? Or people seeing a couple? 99, 66. Okay. okay. Yeah. Awesome. So people. 26. 26. You got 26. Okay. The number I had in my head was 38. Why does that matter? Because you had a one in 100 chance of picking the correct number. Sounds like most of you did not pick 38. If you did. You should type it in right now, and Matthew can give you a prize. <laughs> we'll send you. We'll send you a ball cap if you. Uh, if 95, you got right 42, 75, 89. Not seeing any. Not seeing. No. And you only had one percent chance. Well, guess what? If you were an eel in 1978, 99 percent of the population has collapsed since then. So you know, we were talking about rapid change. That was to illustrate what a 99 percent collapse looks like. And this is not the thing that gets to me with 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 this particular example is we're not talking about a 99 percent collapse since you know, European settlers uh, showed up. We were talking about, this is within my lifetime. Like we were talking about a dramatic collapse that happened within my lifetime. Now in the case of eels, there's many, there's many factors. Hydroelectric dams being built uh, over the course of the last decades is really a driving factor. There's, there's others, there's, you know, over-exploitation. Um, but dams are a big one and their eels are migratory species. So they're being impeded on their way up, on their way down. In Cornwall, you know, there's dams on the St. Lawrence. 
uh, there's, we'll, we'll look at the next slide here, because yeah, that illustrates the collapse that, it sounds like most of you just were part of this collapse because no one gets 38. But if you look at those different graphs, you see that there's a huge crash happening. And this, this particular one only goes to 20, 2007 or eight. So imagine a continued crash. The black dots there are the Ontario population. So really there's been a 99% collapse you know, again, within our lifetimes, we're not talking about 400 years here. Um, and in fact, for the Ottawa River, I know this much about the Ottawa River, American eels were actually uh, the primary biomass of the Ottawa River uh, several hundred years ago. So up to 50% of the entire fish biomass of the Ottawa River was American eel. So just imagine what that's done to the ecosystem in terms of changes. Um, so we were talking about dams. Oh, never mind, go back one. We're talking about dams. I just want to point out that as we speak right now, dams are a huge issue uh, in, in all the watersheds. In the Ottawa River watershed, the very first dam that a migrating eel would encounter on its way up the Ottawa River is called the Cahillon Dam. It's the biggest generating station we have on the river. It's about 750 megawatts. Um, that dam was constructed in the early 60s and has no fish passage whatsoever. There's no eel ladder. So, if you can imagine you're, you're an eel, you've been you know, in the Sargasso Sea, you're on your way back up the St. Lawrence River first and then up the Ottawa River, you hit this massive wall and you can't get around it. There's no fish passage. Um, and as we speak, actually, it was just recently announced that uh, Hydro-Quebec will be investing $750 million for upgrades to that dam. So 750 million bucks is a lot of money. It's actually more, it's a bigger, amount of money than the budget for the entire Quebec Ministry of Wildlife. Like that's how much money this is. Um, and for now, there's no plans to build an eel ladder as part of that massive overhaul. So not if we can help it. Uh, we, we, we cannot allow ourselves in this century to continue making infrastructure upgrades like this without thinking about uh, endangered species. Of course, there's a bunch of other issues, uh, combined sewer overflows, which are a problem here locally, but also in the St. Lawrence. Uh, those are a product of uh, infrastructure that was, you know, built in some cases 50 years ago, 100 years ago, uh, when we we didn't care, quite frankly, we didn't care about uh, having our raw sewage just being dumped into our waterways. So it's it's a bit of a legacy issue today. We know better, and the and the uh, the sewage infrastructure that we build today uh, is not what they called combined sewers. So. You know, what we're dealing with here is a legacy problem from, you know, decades and decades of, of neglect. Here locally in Ottawa Gatineau, we've got dozens of these sites that are still uh, spewing untreated sewage when there's heavy rain. So it's an ongoing issue. The city of Ottawa has invested millions of dollars to improve that. And it has frankly, uh, it's it's really worked. So we've had, we have 80, at least 80% fewer sewage overflows now. Uh, but think about everything that goes down the drain that would just wind up in the rivers untreated. We can't have that anymore. It's the 20th century, so 21st century. So, you know, we need to work on that. So, taking the pledge. So, th this part of the presentation is all about, you know, we scared you with all these dramatic plunges and these climate change graphs, you know, this hydrology. So, what are we going to do about that? And we want to, we want to, talk about a few solutions that you can do to uh, to help improve the situation. So um, a, a couple of, of suggestions that we've developed uh, with, with thinking about uh, Patrick and I, things that are simple to use and really to show that everyone has a role in protecting and improving water conditions, um, not only locally, but that will have a global impact for everyone. So we have um, a couple of, of ideas. We can reduce road salts. Um, I think Patrick, you, you, you had explained that we don't need that much in our driveway. Uh, we need a lot less than what we typically apply. We can uh, connect with our waterway. So sometimes we say at Riverkeeper, you know, it's important to swim, drink and fish. Get out there and use your waterways. You know, it's the most important thing you can do to connect and to better understand them. Um, we should be uh, aware of uh, the amount of water that we have and um, we, we could work on using less water. I think all the new technologies, the new innovations that have been developed in the field of water um, is going that way. So, but there is still a long way to go. Canadians tend to consume a lot of water per capita compared to other people on, on the planet. 
Uh, this is an easy one. Drink tap bottled, not drink tap water, not bottled water. We are so fortunate to have amazing, uh, you know, drinking water in in large municipalities in Canada. We should point out that it's still not the case for many First Nations communities in Canada. That's also unacceptable. But if you're fortunate enough to be living in a municipality where there's treated drinking water, then ditch the plastic. Um, we should think about the use of uh, household products and some of them do contain harmful uh, contaminants. Uh, the river keeper here in Ottawa has um, worked a lot in uh, about looking at triclosan um, as one of the chemical of concerns that should be added to the list of dangerous contaminants. So just pay attention to the products you're using in terms of soap, cleaning products, toothpaste even could be uh, could have some harmful com um, content sometimes. Definitely, and fertilizers. I mean, if you're going if you're going to be fertilizing uh, your yard or whatever, uh, there are definitely organic ways to be doing that. Fertilizers can cause. You saw some of those nasty pictures that Jerome was showing you with uh, algal blooms or whatnot. Certainly, uh, synthetic fertilizers contribute to that. So be very careful about what you apply to your to your yard. And last, uh, try to protect the areas close to the water. It is so important to think about the connection between the land and the water. Maintain the vegetation, improve the vegetation. There are lots of programs uh, that exist to help you do that. Um, and uh, yeah, to maintain healthy ecosystems, to maintain terrestrial ecosystems that will help maintaining the water. This is, I don't know, Patrick, but this is for me the first presentation since we are on COVID. Yeah. COVID has put just a hammer on all of us. Um, and um, I would just add that last thought, um, thinking about how to prevent disease on the planet. And uh, we all agree and we hope really, really that a vaccine is going to be found for mm -hmm. COVID soon. Uh, but there are there is a list of things we can do to prevent disease on the planet. And the vaccines are the second most effective uh, methods to uh, prevent disease on, on this planet. The number one way to prevent disease is clean water. And, and we should keep that in mind uh, because unfortunately, even in Canada, not everyone has access to clean water. Absolutely, that's a really good point. Um, so we've given you a couple suggestions. By all means, you can do them all. We would love it if you did them all. So now that you're watershed aware, it's time, time to, to show, show you that care. you care. <laughs> uh, I think there might be one more slide. Yes, of course. So here's the thing. Usually at this point in a presentation, it's a real life presentation like we used to have in the good old days. So we would throw up a slide like this and we would just say, yeah, follow us on social media. Have a nice day. However, we know for a fact that you're in front of your computer right now. <laughs> so that makes it much, much easier to go like us on all these different channels. Uh, please do that. I can tell you as of this morning, we had 9,952 people following us on Facebook. So I hope by the time I step away from the screen, we'll have moved on that. Um, and I do want to take the opportunity to thank Jerome, thank the River Institute. We are huge huge fans of the work that the River Institute does. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, the crew. Um, yeah, we're very inspired and we have so much in common. So it's great to be, have these opportunities to work together. Merci beaucoup, uh, l'Institut. Uh, I miss you uh, dearly <laughs> almost every day. Let's not go into details, um, but uh, thank you for the opportunity and hopefully you have enjoyed this um, public community uh, presentation. Thank you. Jerome and Patrick, thank you so much. We should have, you know, got hold of some like round of applause so we could give it to you, you know, even in these situations. You can see everyone behind the scenes here giving you a clap. It's so great to have you here. Thanks so much for coming. I'm going to finish off by just saying that for Community Day today, um, I think that the booths that we set up, um, if people were attending here, then of course they weren't over at the booths. I have been through the booths and it looks like there are still two booths open this afternoon. So if you want to go onto the booths page and visit some people through a, a, an online meeting, you can see them there, you can chat to them in person, um, please do that. And also, for those people who were manning the booths this morning, it was an experiment. I hope people visited you, but also if you go this afternoon, there's some videos that you can link to. Um, so this is going to be the, the last live presentation for the symposium today. Tomorrow we start again, so we welcome you all back tomorrow. Um, we've got a full day of science talks. 
Um, and yeah, we'd love to have you back. So thanks for joining us today and we look forward to having you all online again tomorrow. Bye from all of us.